Welcome to the first part of Lecture 6, Integrate Rational Functions, Applying Cavalieri with a Touch of Factoring. This lecture is a little bit long. I apologize for that, but there didn't seem to be any convenient place to break it up. We're going to start by looking at some trigonometric identities. I'm going to assume that you know and can derive, if needed, the relevant derivatives of sine, cosine, and tangent. You really should know these cold. d by dx of sine x is cosine x, d by dx of cosine x is minus sine x, and d by dx of tan x is 1 over cosine squared x or secant squared x. Probably less known for you are the inverse functions, and as we discussed before, they are defined on particular ranges. The ranges are typically running from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, or they're running from 0 to pi. And pictured here on the upper left is the arc sine. That goes from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. You have the arc cosine, which that seems to be oriented in the wrong way in this particular figure. That typically goes from 0 to pi. You have the arc tangent, which is going from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. You have the arc secant, which is going from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, uh, arc cosecant, and so forth. And they have the particular ranges in which they're defined that you can work out there. I take it back. That second one is, is a correct uh, one. The x value is the value of the cosine between minus 1 and 1, and the y value is what angle gives that. And we have to, it's the angle that we have to restrict between a range from uh, that has a length that's equal to pi, because otherwise these functions are periodic and they repeat, and then the function is not single value. Okay, the next thing we need to do is figure out how do we calculate derivatives of these things. So if x is equal to arc cosine of y, that means cosine x is equal to y. I know how to take the derivative of a cosine, dy dx is just minus sine x. Let me replace sine x in terms of cosine x. Sine x is just 1 minus cosine squared x, but cosine x is equal to y, so it's equal to the square root of 1 minus y squared. And now I calculated dy dx, I just have to calculate dx dy to get the derivative of arc cosine with respect to y, and I get minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus y squared. And then you do the same thing for the sine, and you'll get 1 over the square root of 1 minus y squared without the minus sign in front. And finally, for the arc tangent, you take that derivative, you get 1 over 1 plus y squared. And the key thing to note here is that these derivatives naturally have square roots that are appearing in them. And so they can actually be used to integrate integrands that have square roots in the denominators. And we'll be talking about that a little bit as we get further along into the lecture. All right, so let's start with the simplest thing, integrating polynomials. You need to recall the Cavalieri result that the integral of a power was x to the n was x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And that holds for every n except, of course, for n equals minus 1 because we can't divide by 0. And we know that the integral of 1 over x is actually equal to the logarithm of x. So using this, we can integrate any power that comes up. And that means we can integrate any polynomial. If I have a polynomial of degree n, pn of x, it's got a power series expansion from m equals 0 up to n with some numerical coefficients a m multiplied by x to the m. I just pull that summation outside the integral, which I can do because it's a finite sum, and I just integrate the power, and I get the final result, sum m equals 0 to n, a m over m plus 1, x to the m plus 1, plus some arbitrary constant, because this would be an antiderivative that we're evaluating, and those are determined up to some overall constant. We can similarly integrate any polynomial divided by a monomial. The monomial is going to just be x minus a, and so let's take a look at what that looks like. What we're going to do here is the famous adding zero trick. We're going to add pn of a and subtract pn of a. We're doing that so that the term, the first term, is going to vanish when x equals a. And so that means it has a power of x minus a that can be factored out of it. So that first term does not have any singularity in it. I've removed the singularity by subtracting pn of a. Similarly, the last term which has a pn of a divided by x minus a, I know how to integrate that. That's a logarithm. So what we're going to find is we have this complicated expansion. Here I'm just writing out explicitly what pn of x minus pn of a is in the numerator on the term on the left. And we've explicitly integrated the second term as well. And now you have to go back and remember the identity that we used in order to derive the geometric series. 
that identity showed that if I multiply x minus a times x to the m plus a times x to the m minus 1 and so forth, I'll get x to the m plus 1 minus a to the m plus 1. And if we then uh, invert that and look at solving that left-hand side in terms of the right-hand side, you see there's a factorization. And so I can write that factorization. I'll get an a1, then I'll get an a2 times an x plus a. a n will be times x to the n minus 1 plus a x to the n minus 2 and so forth. And now I have a really big and complicated polynomial, but I can just integrate that. So this solves the problem of integrating the uh, polynomial that's divided by a monomial. Now, what if we divide it instead by a monomial that's raised to a particular power? Okay, that's going to be the next one that we're going to work out. So you can see that this procedure is exact. It's kind of tedious, and so I wouldn't recommend... Uh, actually working it out yourself by hand for complicated cases, you should use a symbolic manipulation program. But the idea is to figure out and understand exactly how these things work. So what if we had a situation where that monomial was raised to the nth power? Well, in that case, we do the same trick. We subtract and add the zero. We have the term on the right-hand side that can be directly integrated. The term on the left-hand side, that numerator, vanishes when x equals a. So it has a factor of x minus a that can be pulled out of it, and that factor will reduce the power in the denominator by a power of 1. And then we can iterate this. We can keep doing this. And each time we do it, we're going to remove a power from the denominator. And we're going to keep going until eventually we're going to get into a situation where either the numerator becomes a constant, so there's nothing left to remove anymore, and I can just do the integral, or the denominator does, and then I have the final integral that I have to evaluate. This full integration is very tedious, but it is straightforward. I just want to make sure that you completely understand what happens. If I have an integral with a polynomial divided by x minus a to the m, I can, by writing it in this form, in this equation, I can re-express it as an integral of a polynomial. It's a different polynomial divided by x minus a to the m minus 1. Okay, so that has gotten me closer to the example that we just worked out where the power m was equal to 1. I just keep reiterate, I keep iterating that until I get to the point where I get to the power m equals 1, and then I can just integrate the thing. It's a very straightforward process, but it's incredibly tedious, and so I don't really recommend that you do it this way. Uh, instead, I would recommend that you go and uh, look up in Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha or your favorite symbolic manipulation package and have it work out the details of what such an integral would be. But in principle, if you were on a desert island and you were isolated and you had to evaluate this integral, then you can do it. And the main point is it's important to understand where these formulas come from when you're using these symbolic machines, not that these machines are somehow uh, remarkably intelligent and work these things out on their own. They're essentially following these rules. They can just do those rules much more efficiently than you can. All right, so what about more complex denominators? Well, there are many other types of integrals that can also be integrated using these kinds of techniques. If you recall, we've already seen that the integral dx of 1 over 1 plus x squared will be the arctan of x because we showed that that integrand was the derivative of the arctan of x. And similarly, if I had 1 over x minus a and 1 over x minus b, where a and b were not equal to each other, I can integrate that as 1 over a minus b, the logarithm of x minus a divided by x minus b. You should be comfortable and familiar with these things. That second integral would come just by doing an expansion in partial fractions. The book describes how we can generalize these results to a full quadratic, ax squared plus bx plus c, essentially because we can factorize that. It will result into one of these two kinds of cases. And similarly, you can also integrate all rational functions of the form some polynomial divided by that quadratic raised to some power. And that's just, once again, working and iterating the kinds of things that we've already done. So uh, another point is that if I had any rational function of sines and cosines, they also can be integrated. And the strategy here is by defining t equals tangent of the half angle, we can then write sine x is 2t over 1 plus t squared, cosine x is 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared, and dx dt is equal to 2 over 1 plus t squared. So we can convert the integral over x into an integral over t, and that integral over t involves now a rational function of t. Because I have powers of 2t, I have powers of 1 plus t squared, 1 minus t squared, etc., 
but it's ultimately going to just be a rational function of t. And we've just shown you that whenever we have rational functions, we can integrate these things. So all rational functions of sines and cosines can also be integrated by using this trick. So on to even more complex cases. What if we have a situation where the denominator involves a square root? So let's look at square root of a squared minus x squared. We're, of course, going to limit x to be absolute value less than a for this. Any rational function of x and a squared minus x squared can also be integrated. All we have to do is let x equal a cosine phi, then dx d phi is minus a sine phi, and square root of a squared minus x squared is a sine phi. And so by plugging into that rational function, we've now converted it into a rational function of sines and cosines. And we just showed that any rational function of sines and cosines can be integrated by converting to this t representation. Very, very tedious, very, very easy to make mistakes and so forth. So much better for a computer to do it for you. But in principle, these all can be integrated. Now, it turns out this also works for any rational function of x and the more complicated quadratic, ax squared plus bx plus c, and the details for that are described in the book. And it turns out that that's as far as you can go. If you try to look at the next most complicated rational functions with the square root of a quartic, ax to the fourth plus bx cubed plus cx squared plus dx plus e, those can only be integrated in general by including functions that are called elliptic functions. The elliptic functions are very similar to trig functions. If you recall, trig functions are sometimes called circular functions. But unlike the trig functions, which are defined relative to a circle, the elliptic functions are defined relative to an ellipse. And that's why they're called elliptical functions. And they have different properties, but they're very similar. They oscillate and other things like that. And there are relations between the sums of the squares of different functions and so forth. But going down this road is going way beyond what we're going to do in, in this class itself. Okay, so this incorporates nearly all of the kinds of integrals that can be done relatively easily. Others that come up, it turns out, they tend to be used to define new functions. This is how things like gamma function was defined, how something called a Bessel's function was defined, and other things like that. So what mathematicians like to do is if they get an integral that's so complicated, it's important, they want to be able to do it, but it doesn't fall into one of these categories that they can actually evaluate it. They say, all right, well, let's just define a function that happens to depend on that particular integral, and then let's try and find out what the properties of those functions are.